next room down. Uh, good morning. Today is Thursday, April 7th, 2022. It's 9.03 a.m. and this is the meeting of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. We are uh, resuming work on Bill H-175, inactivating to the beverage container redemption system. Uh, there is a there are some members of a working group we'll be hearing from uh, later, but we wanted to start with um, uh, Ethan Hayes, general manager of Morrisville Beverage, who uh, uh, offered to speak with the committee about his operations and how the bill uh, would impact those, you know, his business. So good morning, Mr. Hayes. Thanks for joining us. And um, are you there? <laughs> I'm not sure if you're hearing us or not. Mr. Hayes, can you hear us? He was, he's been on for like 10 minutes. Okay, well, he stepped away from his computer. Um, he was listed later in the batting order, but rather than have him wait through other witnesses, decided to just let him speak and get back to work. So we'll stand by for a moment until Mr. Hayes. I'm going to go get my iPad. Computer. I do have to leave at 10. Okay. So, um, Senators McDonald and Campion, we we have we're taking up the bottle bill yeah and uh our first witness is from a beverage center right and that's mr hayes yes okay uh then have to have matt chapman in yeah so I'm, i get to the agenda okay unless it's changed no, no, just add it. What? So for anyone who's streaming this, uh, watching, we are waiting for a uh, witness to arrive back on the Zoom session. I got my phone back. What happened to it? Senator Stuprat picked it up off our common territory and put it, took it home last night. Uh -huh. And he didn't answer about all my phone calls. Oh, and he could have answered on my name. That would have been a good deal. Hey, someone accidentally steals from me. My first year in the Senate, I treated myself to a Burberry trench coat. Uh -huh. I'm a state senator, I'm gonna look good. <laughs> I had it for about a week. What happened and to it? It was we used to use the, the cloak room. Yeah. When I went back oh, for it, it was gone and there was a London fog. Hi, Mr. Hayes, this is Judge Newman right from Senate Natural Resources. You, you got downgraded. I got downgraded. Are ready for your testimony and I think it was probably an honest off. mistake. Sure. Did you get it back? No. no. So maybe it wasn't entirely. I used to, I used to put on my blazer to go up to the second corner. It was a little tight. I have to go up and get all Maynard for the second, third, fourth, and five. <laughs> oh, man. You, you grabbed my blazer. Again? Again. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. One of the reasons I leave my scarf stuffed into my over top coat sleeve is that there'd be no way you could put that top coat on and not realize it. Run out of bright orange scarf and go, wait, this is, this is not my coat. Okay. Doing some other guests. So I can obviously get text it all. Email. Um, did you? Were you speaking this morning? Oh, my email message. He said a response that ended it, and the horse he wrote in. No, oh, that's mad. <laughs> They're mad at us. So, to um, Mr. Chapman and all the working group folks that are on the session, uh, we uh, 
are waiting for Mr. Hayes, who has been with us and then stepped away from his computer or something. We're hoping to get him back online momentarily, and then we'll pick up with Mr. Chapman. Mike is off, so I'm not sure if you can ask him if you can hear him. Paper doesn't help. So, Mr. Hayes, have you spoken to him on screen prior? No, I called him on my phone. I'll call again. There he is. Getting off to a legislative start here. We're getting off to a legislative start. Is right. Yeah. So while we're we're doing this, my hope is uh, on other. Hello. Hi, Mr. Hayes. Are you on? We we can see your screen, but we can't hear you or see you. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. And on you can start doing this. So what? Can you just drop and call back in? Can you drop off and come back in? Uh, let me see if I can try. Yeah, you just end the session and then. Should premiere, by the way. Um, it, so looking ahead, so um, I would like to ask us to meet again Monday, three to five. Apologize, I know that that puts a strain on everyone's schedule. I know, I know. Appropriations will be meeting because we have to get the bill up by a week from Friday. So we've already been told to save the whole day. Yeah, sure, so just wait for okay. Okay, is that correct? This okay. coming Monday. Oh, um, I'm hoping we can finish on. Oh, I can't do this Monday. I'm away. And then I'm here uh, late. Does that mean Sunday? Sunday meeting. <clears throat> Saturday's <throat> raining all day. So. I don't know if there's ever been a weekend session. No, I travel, I'm traveling all weekend, but others might be. Here he is. I think Friday. No. And this time. Right, so Hopefully we'll... this will work, Mr. Hayes. I'm going to hang up. Now. Today, opening day. Okay. Is she? Uh, you know, you're ahead of me in that one. Well, okay, so Mr. Hayes, we see your square. I don't know if you can hear us. And we can't. Uh, you're not muted, so we should be able to hear you. And we can't. Yeah, I can video. barely hear. Um, we can hear you. Okay, well that's good. <laughs> it's a start. Okay, so, uh, we don't. The video is just a, an add-on, so if um, if we can just hear you, that's plenty for us. Well, we'd like to, as you know, we're looking at the bottle bill, um, and you if you could talk to us about your operation and how this uh, bill would affect your operation and if you have any recommendations for something you think could be improved uh, we're happy to hear from you okay so, sounds good take it away okay well my name is ethan hayes i'm the general manager of morrisville beverage uh, independent beverage store we're a vermont liquor agency and a certified bottle redemption center here in morrisville um, our bottle redemption center processes approximately 4 million containers a year. Um, we support H-175 and the expansion of the containers that are proposed. Uh, we support raising the deposit rate and the handling fee. We, we echo what others have said before. The bottle bills help keep litter off Vermont roadsides and out of waterways, kept containers in the loop to be more likely remade into new containers. Um, and it provides high paying jobs at well above minimum wage for Vermonters. Um, our company, we recently invested this past October in significantly upgrading our facility uh, and technology. Uh, prior to October, we were a hand count only facility, two full-time employees. Um, as a result of labor shortages throughout our whole store, not, not just uh, in the redemption center, uh, we researched and ultimately purchased new reverse vending machine equipment <clears throat> that at the time had just been released to the market. Um, in fact, we were the first privately owned redemption center in the country 
to purchase and utilize this new machine. Um, it had been used in other facilities. It's actually purchased from Tamra um, and it had been used in some of their redemption facilities, but hadn't been released to any private uh, redemption centers. Um, and unlike a traditional RVM where you stand there and put one container in at a time, uh, this technology allows customers to come in with 100 plus uh, aluminum cans and plastic containers in one bag or box, pour them into the machine, um, and it does its thing from counting to sorting and giving the customers uh, a slip to redeem. Um, we still employ all the same staff that we had prior to installing the RVMs, and we haven't cut one hour of labor from any employee's schedule. Um, what the RVM has allowed us to do is to allocate our labor in a more productive way. Instead of spending hours sorting through hundreds of distributor sorts, our employees are assisting customers more directly, uh, maintaining a cleaner facility, and providing much needed labor in the front of our store um, throughout the rest of the building. Uh, we've innovated and expanded as well at the same time by offering drop-off service for customers. We've engaged with many local charities for bottle drives. Uh, we purchased a trailer to work with charities for bottle drives and to pick up containers. Um, and that's proving to be an immediate success. Um, I've heard some of the other testimony and I've heard other retailers speak of challenges with redemptions. And even the comment that it would be impossible to implement an expansion in containers covered under this bill. We welcome the challenge. And as the more customers that come to our bottle return equal more customers that are shopping in our store. Um, not only do we get into this from the recycling point of view, but the, the customers that come in to redeem products at our store, uh, ultimately the majority of them, 75 to 80% end up spending that money back in our store. Um, other retailers have expressed concerns too regarding uh, product pickup being inconsistent or problematic. And that's true. In the past, we've had times when pickups became an issue. Most of that was during the height of COVID. Um, but in almost every occasion, a phone call to the depot has taken care of the issue. Um, and in fact, if we're missed on a pickup, generally within the next day or two, uh, we get another truck in to get us uh, picked up. Uh, I think we think the benefits of expansion are numerous. And as you've heard many others in many other testimony, uh, we're here to say that it can work. And the challenges that, that arise, uh, we think um, we and others can handle. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have, kind of pick our brain as to our operation and uh, any of your thoughts. Uh, Senator Campion. So uh, one of the things we've heard, Mr. Hayes, is that uh, some individuals don't have the space to deal with everything. Can you tell us a little bit about the size of, of your facility? And that uh, and with that space limitations, they, they may need to build out. That is a possibility. And I think that's true. Anytime you grow your business, um, you may have to make some investment in, in space or learn to do things uh, more efficiently. One thing that this uh, RVM technology has allowed us to do is instead of having a back room that is entirely full of bags, which have approximately 240 containers in each, you know, this machine crushes all the containers um, and each Gaylord holds the equivalent of about 40 bags. So we've been much, we've been able to much better utilize our space um, and has given us room for expansion. Um, I know that not everybody can do that. And I understand that it's tough from building out the infrastructure to getting the machines. Um, I can only speak from our point of view that we know we can handle it. And, and if it came to the point where we run short on space, then we would look at what we need to do to accommodate that. And how, how large is your facility now? Um, I, I don't know the square footage off the, the top of my head. Um, it, 500 square feet, 10,000 square feet? Yeah, it's above 10,000. Thank you. Um, so can you say a little more about the RVNs? Um, do you lease them? Do you buy them? And, and what, what's the cost that uh, for doing either? Sure, we, we did not go with a lease program. Uh, we didn't feel that that would be beneficial to us in the long run. We chose to purchase and own the machines. Um, I, I can't give you the exact pricing on it, but the R1, which is the, the, the newest machine that does aluminum and plastic together um, was 
in the over a hundred thousand dollars um, for that machine. Um, we did have to put in a second machine, a smaller one uh, for the glass because the R1 doesn't accept glass. Um, and that's, um, that's a little over $20,000 uh, for that investment. And we expect with the volume that we're, we have now without any expansion, about a five-year payoff on those machines. And, and if the bottle bill were to expand as uh, outlined in 175, would you, in order to manage the additional flows, would you purchase another machine? Is that how you do it? Or just trying to understand how, what, what's next for you if, that, if the bill were to pass? Sure, that's certainly a possibility. We've already discussed that. Um, we've already looked at additional space in our facility. Um, part of our, our store is, is rented out to another tenant there's possibility of capturing back some of that space and, and using it for redemption. And, and that might include purchasing another R1 uh, machine. Okay. Um, one of the, uh, so it sounds like you have a more advanced RVM than some of the folks we've talked to like grocery stores that have them out front. Um, uh, one of the challenges we heard some people expressing for instance, in Waitsfield, uh, Lawson's finest liquids is right there. So there are people buying beer from that uh, brewery and then uh, two blocks away at the RVM at Mahern's Market, they can't redeem them because the database doesn't include that Vermont brand. So uh, I don't know if that's an unusual experience or how many things, how often is that database uh, updated and do you can you say hey we have someone right here in Morrisville that's brewing and we get a lot of everything so it may not be a big deal to Tamra but it's big for us as a local distributor and store yes absolutely we we have a, a, essentially a tablet that allows us to upload the barcode to Tamra right here at the store then they go through their process of contacting the distributor and getting it approved through the machine machine updates daily so anything that that Tamra has been able to work through does come down through to the machine um, and when we find that there is a container that we are receiving a lot of that for whatever reason is not in the database it generally only takes a phone call to Tamra to say hey we're receiving this container all the time and it's not in um, you know example was the alchemist heady topper for for some reason that wasn't being processed and we process a lot of that container the next day, it was in our system. Um, it, it was essentially a non-issue. Um, when we first installed the machines as well, uh, none of um, uh, liquor bottles, glass liquor bottles or plastic were in the system. That's for some reason that had just been missed on Tamra's end. Um, and after some attempts to get the, the barcodes from the state and, and get that uploaded that basically failed, uh, Tamra actually came in there and, and um, uh, with some software and a computer and scanned every liquor bottle in the store to get that uploaded to the system. And within 48 hours, we were then able to accept all those liquor bottles in our machine. Great. Well, that's so. And how uh, is your machine online or does it use cellular technology? How is it that it's, uh, it is kept so current? Uh, it's connected directly hardwired to our internet. Uh, we have, you know, fairly high speed internet for all the other stuff that we have in the store. So it was just uh, something else to connect to it. Okay. Um, and what's the reject rate on the RVMs? What, you know, I don't know how you, like a percentage, uh, did ninety-five percent of the bottles go, or, or containers go through, or hundred percent, fifty percent? What's yeah? We run around a ten percent rejection rate right now. That uh, since October, that's been the average uh, of containers that have been rejected. Okay, and so with ninety percent going through the machine, then on on sort of the back side of the machine. <clears throat> How many uh, sorts do you still end up having? Uh, what goes through the machine, there is no, the only sort that takes place at that point is between aluminum and plastic. That's it. 
the the machine right. when it reads the barcode determines whether it's a a commingle program product or not um and sends that data and that's how we get invoiced but we have two gaylord set up under um two conveyor belts uh one for aluminum one for plastic and that's the only sort that takes place okay um, but for the rejected ones, do you have sort of old style, you know, cardboard bins and you're sorting those into the, the bins for Tom to pick up in plastic bags, the old school way? Yes, we do. And we look through the rejects as they come out. Uh, we check the database to see, to make sure that they've been entered so that uh, Tom is working on getting those into the system. Um, and then what's not, we, we sort out by hand and and send out in bags on a truck with our Gaylords every week. Okay, so the, I think from what we've taken for testimony in our field trip, we're seeing that people have roughly 110, 120 swords. So you have, is it correct to say that you have less volume, you still have 120 swords or so, but 90% of your material is just being sorted automatically by the RBA? That's correct. Okay. Um, and it sounds like it saves you a lot of space. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Tremendous amount of space compared to what we had. Yes. Um, so when we had testimony about the system in Maine, uh, the number of product codes, I think Vermont has about 16,000. Maine has 49,000. Um, is it your sense that... Uh, the, these more advanced versions, I guess, of an RVM will just be reprogrammed and able to, you know, you'll still get only a 10% reject rate and 90% of your materials will get processed that way. Have you had any conversations with Tamara about their experience in Maine? Uh, no, we haven't spoken too, too much about what's happened in Maine. Um, I, I think it's important that there be some piece of the legislation that requires that barcodes be uh, sent and upload or, or transmitted to Tamra before they hit the market. I think that would save us a, a tremendous amount of time and the backlog um, if that information is coming from the beverage companies directly to Tamra before that product hits the shelves. Uh, that gives them time to get it uploaded, get it into the system so that by the time it reaches our machine, it's already ready to go. Okay. Um... Thank you very much. Let me, uh, yeah, Senator McCormick. Um, if you had uh, an operation that doesn't have your technology and they wanted to acquire it, mm -hmm. say, if I'm understanding your testimony correctly, it's sort of like what, what the bill envisions can work for some people right now and not for others. Sure. It's largely because of technology. If someone wanted to acquire the technology you have and, and upgrade, about what would it cost? Um, they're looking at a, a, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollar investment um, in the machines, um, and then depending on the upfit that they want to do to their facility. I mean, we took a twenty-five year old bottle room, really old and pretty gross bottle room and transformed it into a bottle and can recycling center. So, you know, on top of the machines, we put a, a fairly significant investment into cleaning up our facility um, as well. So it, yes, there's a significant cost up front. Um, you know, I, again, it's a, based on our volume right now, it's about a five year payoff. Obviously if the, if the bill goes through and that volume increases, it's going to uh, reduce the time it takes for us to, to pay that off. Um, and your experience, if I understand it correctly, your experience is that however big that upfront investment was, uh, this, this is proving profitable for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And it's profitable, not just as from redeeming the containers again, but we, we are seeing that those dollars spent in the store. Um, it, like it says, 75 to 80% of the dollars that are redeemed are, are spent right back in our store. It's kind of a no-brainer for us. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, are we done? No, I have a follow-up question. So I, I think you mentioned about uh, agreeing with the bill's 
proposed to change the handling fee. Um, and, but even without, it sounds like you're saying that even without it, I'm not debating whether it's a good idea, I'm just, even without that change, you're seeing a five-year payback for your capital investment in upgrading your facility. Is that what I heard you say? That's correct. Okay, so if the, the commingling, non-commingling difference rises, it'll shorten it up even further, right? That That's right? correct, yes. Okay. Um, are you supporting the fees as uh, listed where three and a half, four goes to three and a half, five? Uh, or are you proposing something other than how the bill currently has it? Uh, no, we're not. We didn't um, dig into it enough to to say one way or another whether we think it should be a, a lot more. Um, you know, we're we're in support that there needs to be um, some kind of increase due to just inflationary pressures, and um, and you know, we think there can be a benefit to uh, to not only for us for paying for machines and technology, but for other retailers to be able to do the same. Okay. Um... All right, great. Uh, Senator Westman. So, Ethan, this is Rich Westman. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Okay, great. I'm going to stop, and it'll probably be around 5 o'clock, and I look forward to touring this, the site. Absolutely. I look forward to showing it off to you. Okay, great. Um, Ethan, anything else you would like to share with us before we go on to hear from other folks? Uh, I don't think so. I just, uh, I guess the only thing would be say, um, you know, there are a lot of redemption centers in Vermont that support this. And I think, um, although there are some that are going to have some significant challenges and maybe, um, have sort of a negative, uh, outlook on it right now, that shouldn't, um, that shouldn't stop the process, um, from rolling forward. There are ways and there are innovations, um, for, for people who run a business well to, to make things happen and to overcome challenges. Sure. Um, and you remind me, so redemption centers and the number of them is one of the things we heard taken testimony on. So you're in uh, Morrisville. <clears throat> how, how far and to where would you travel each, each way to get to the next redemption center? Um, probably Hardwick or Stowe are the, are the two next closest redemption centers to us. Neither, I, I think Stowe is a certified redemption center. I'm pretty sure Hardwick is not. Um, uh, so those are the two next closest to us. Okay. So I'm sorry, Hardwick's a certified redemption center or it's not? Hardwick is not, no. All right. Um, any other so many questions for Mr. Hayes? All right, great. Thanks for joining us. And I'm glad we got over the electronic kickoffs at the beginning. There. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Okay. Have a good day. You too. Bye. That lets you go to uh, Mr. Chapman. We just wanted invited people in from the working group. And uh, we had a schedule this last week. Not really sure how far that group has gone. So we're not really looking to have a complete discussion, but we had scheduled basically a check-in time to see uh, how, how things were going, whether or not people felt like there was uh, sort of a clear enough committee request to the working group so that you felt like you're, um, you know what we're asking for. And we just wanna basically check in briefly and uh, support your work and thank you for uh, digging into these things. So, Mr. Chapman, as you're the convener, uh, and, and we're hoping that he has a solution. Yes. <laughs> um, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, not to get to the punchline, but that would be pretty great too. So, Mr. Chapman. So, for the record, Matt Chapman, um, Director of Waste Management and Prevention Division within DEC. Um, we have met once and have two additional meetings scheduled. Um, I would characterize the meeting that we had as, as constructive and that people, I think, are, you know, did a, a good job of sort of explaining where they were and, and um, 
what their view was with respect to various issues. The issues that we looked at, Senator Bray, are the issues that you provided from the whiteboard. So, so yeah. to some degree, that is what this group is focused on. I'm assuming that those are the, the areas the committee wants us to focus in on. Okay, great. And um, just for people who may be streaming this, I'll read them off from our whiteboard. It, number one was pick up more often. Uh, and it's kind of to these concerns around capacity and Tomer's ability to service more volume. Uh, number two, who owns the new bottles? So basically, someone's got to be in charge of the deposits plus the handling fees. And if they're coming in through uh, large out-of-state entities that don't have a like a bottling presence in Vermont, how how is that system going to know uh, how to track that billing, how to handle the money around the obligations created by the bill? Three, uh, the rollout time where the bill has its original date from last year, which obviously July 1 of this year is not practicable, but um, we are looking back at the rollout of the switch from single use plastic bags to reusable bags. That had about a 16 month runway and it went into effect with um, hardly any problem. So we're, thinking about what's what's the right period of time to make a major change like this how much time to get everybody ready uh, number four was revised scope of containers uh we were hearing about the challenges of having more sorts uh for instance mr chapman you reported out the experience in maine and so we were concerned about that so one possible way of dealing with that concern is to reduce the scope of what's captured under a modified bottle bill. And then five was um, to consider a producer responsibility organization or extend producer responsibility, whatever you want to call it. And I think that comes in part from uh, some folks that we took testimony from were suggesting that was a, long a more robust long-term solution. And then I think the committee also had the perspective of the bottle bill does obviously exists next to the single screen system. And how is Vermont thinking about from a solid waste perspective overall, where do we want to be in three years or five years or 10 years? Is any so that anything we do now on the bottle bill should anticipate where we want to be with other materials as well, so that we don't create um, a difficulty in having a more comprehensive system, you know, whatever, three, five, and 10 years out. So we don't think basically send ourselves down a path that we say, well, we wish we had done that uh, five years from now. So that's, that's the list of five. An annotated list of five. <laughs> but I want to make sure people understood where, where those five came from. And I guess the last thing I'll just say is, is that um, the committee is, you know, it's con the group is continuing to work. Um, we are trying to reach consensus on those issues. I think it's fair to say we have not reached consensus after our first meeting. Okay. Um, so we're not, uh, I think the committee wants to avoid having individual members sort of argue a case we want to leave you in peace to have your own discussions outside the committee and rather than asking people to, to argue their position with us but uh while you're all here i don't know if uh any of you who are on that panel uh <coughs> want to bring uh you know, make us aware of a question that you think should be should have been in our list of five uh and was not um, so the so the analysis is sound. Uh, Senator Campion, before we, uh, I'm wondering if uh, Mr. Chapman, as the lead of the group, or perhaps somebody else could answer this. Is there something, as we've talked about, all of these areas that some people need to prepare for, uh, different scenarios, different situations, whether it's glass building out space, uh, et cetera. 
is there any part of this that, you know, I, I hate, well, I, I don't actually. I, I think sometimes studying and examining certain rollouts can be helpful uh, before they go into place if need be, uh, not as a, as a filler or as a, we're trying to do something, but we just don't want to do something, but really needs, is there anything that you're identifying now that needs to be looked at that should be pulled into some kind of summer examination, if you will? Is anything like that sort of popping up or no? I guess I would say, Senator, it's premature to okay. say that that's the case. Thank you. Um, so again, uh, I'll just go down the list as we have it. Again, I'm asking panelists not to argue a case, but uh, if you just have something brief you want to share with the committee, when you heard some, uh, you've heard a lot of testimony, um, give you a chance to say something about that, and I'll call first then on, so thank you, Mr. Chapman. Um, call first on Paul Burns. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Paul Burns, the Executive Director of VPIRG, the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, join this working group, um, to be part of these conversations, and to to share that I, I think uh, this morning I would just say that uh, I, I think it was a constructive conversation. I think people uh, fairly presented their different perspectives. There was not certainly unanimity. We wouldn't expect that going in, but there were places of agreement. Um, Matt, uh, I, don't, I don't think chose to say this, but there was agreement, for instance, that we all recognize the increasing role and responsibility for the DEC moving forward. Um, if this program is updated and, and the scope of the law is expanded, um, there was a full agreement from all the participants that uh, some additional staffing for DEC uh, is merited and uh, perhaps two FTEs is what we talked about. And um, as the, un the, the, the value, uh, the number of unclaimed deposits would be increased as you are significantly broadening the scope of the law, uh, that devoting some portion of that to cover the, uh, the increased responsibilities and staffing at DEC um, again, there was no, no dispute, no debate over that. So I, I felt good about having one uh, thing where there was broad agreement. And, um, uh, and I think too, that one of the other things that had a lot of conversation was the idea of having a producer responsibility organization. You've heard you know, some testimony about that. That has not been a priority of ours before. We know that other states have been able to move forward without that, particularly in our region, but we are not we're not saying over our dead body, you know, I, I, we want to be open to that conversation and we're going to have more conversation about that today. I think there is some value uh, to that. I think there are just going to be important questions, obviously, that that we and, and then you may want to grapple with. Um, for instance, I think the policy, important policy decision, decisions would still be the realm of you and your colleagues in the legislature. There is still going to be an important role for administration of that system at DEC. Uh, but there are many aspects of it that the, that the PRO, the industry itself, um, I think could um, uh, fairly um, uh, lead on. Uh, so, you know, the pickup and processing, the product registration, possible fraud, public communication and marketing, reporting um, of the system uh, performance. So the redemption rate, for instance, and what happens to those materials. There's an awful lot that that could be done by industry. Uh, our position is just that we don't think you wanna turn the keys over entirely to the industry to manage uh, this program, just as you wouldn't for uh, a climate program or a tobacco program or anything else like that. It's important that, the, that you, we believe it's important for you to set the parameters, uh, maintain, maintain some administrative enforcement at DEC and then give uh, many other responsibilities to the PRO if you decide to move in that direction. So I just wanted to say, you know, we're certainly open to that. Uh, conversation, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share that with you today. Okay, great. Well, thanks for that just right amount of update. Um, I do have a quick question. Is there an existing PRO program that you think is a particularly good model as it would apply to this part of the solid waste stream? 
Um, if you want to think about it, that's, that's fine. There, there certainly are, Mr. Chairman, there are many PRO programs, uh, in, a number of them really in other countries, you know, Canada and, and um, in Europe, there are a number of examples, for instance, uh, fewer in, in our neck of the woods where states have chosen to go mostly without this kind of program. Uh, but, uh, but certainly, I think that'll be part of our conversation. Okay, thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> any committee questions for Ms. Burns? All right, thank you again. Um, Deeply. Ms. Deeply, good morning. Thanks for joining us again. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, for the record, I'm Bree Deatley. Uh, I'm principal at Breezeway Consulting in Somerville, Massachusetts, and I'm representing the Beverage Association of Vermont. Um, uh, to echo what Paul said, appreciate the opportunity to, um, to have the conversation, to be on the group. Um, I, I think I would uh, add one other thing that we did discuss, and I think might be a supplementary list. It was something Paul brought up specifically yesterday, and I think so, uh, an important issue, and that is just one of general access to redemption. Um, you know, I think that's something that we, uh, again, potentially argue for the producer organization structure, but the sort of notion of kind of leaving it to the whims of, well, we, we hope this works out. We're going to do a bunch of things, and we hope it works out, that there needs to be some more structure around making sure that um, there, people do have access to get their money back, especially as the program expands and potentially we contemplate a higher deposit value at some point in the future. Um, but I think, um, I mean, I appreciate the, the information this morning um, from Morrisville. I, I, I think that's just indicative of the fact that, that there are a lot of solutions out there. Um, there are a lot of technological solutions out there. Uh, but again, if we just throw everything up into the sky and wait for the wind to blow it in the right place and expect it to land in the right place, that's that's probably uh, wishful thinking. So I guess I'm again revealing my bias towards um, some sort of structure over the program, Bruce organization, obviously with the right governance and oversight to sort of rationalize how the system works out. Uh, because you know I, I, this is not an insurmountable problem, and and that's why we have uh, sort of stepped forward and and said as an industry we do support expansion. Um, but, but we would support it under the right terms. We just want to be ready for it. So that's hopefully we can get a little closer to being ready for it. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk to you today. Okay, well, great. So, you know, we've talked a lot about the logistics of redemption from the redemption center on down, but we've also had some conversations too about concerns about consumers. Um, one, it's a massive change. So we want to have a communication about a change of this scale would be really important in order to, to be able to make a change like this without upsetting people. And and part of the potential for upset is, in, okay, now you've trained yourself at home to sort in a different way than you have recently, but now you're 10 or 15 or 20 miles away from a place that can actually redeem on. And so I think that we're concerned about just as you said, access your citizens easily redeem the materials they would be bringing. Right, and I, I think with that, Senator, comes the comes the notion that we um, we shouldn't just be um, anchored in our past thinking about you know not everybody needs to be a beverage mart or a Tom I'm not Tomlinson's uh, Morrisville beverage or you know or a beverage baron there are a lot of folks there, there's a lot of potential for operations that aren't like that um, that are more convenient to people that are lower cost like drop-off express drop-off locations um, where people just kind of swipe and go so the access can be found in a lot of different ways and if you look across the programs um, you know in British Columbia or, or um, you know in Oregon or in your Euro in European countries, yeah, there are a lot of other options to explore and that access doesn't have to mean a full-blown bricks and mortar full service redemption center uh, it can mean something much more uh, much quicker and more convenient okay so you still need the accuracy of making sure you're redeeming and know whose product whatever the counts have to be right etc but you're saying they can just the ultimate sorting etc can be put off to another center you would collect in bulk and then uh, bring this stuff to a larger center that would then handle all the kind of processing. 
just want to make sure I'm understanding the model. Right. Yeah. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. But but you do need you do need that central repository of information. You need that central database that's typically a registration process with a producer organization is how it's done. Um, and uh, and you're registering like Tarma registers barcodes today to service its reverse vending machines um, and its scanning technologies. That essentially becomes a public a public source or, you know, if Tarma is the vendor that's managing the system, then Tarma is the one that manages and maintains that database. But that's critical, especially with expansion. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any committee questions for Ms. Deeper? All right, thank you again. With that, I'd like to go on to Chuck Regal. And let me check whether I got Regal right or if it's Regal. Uh, we don't hear you yet. I think your mic is He's muted. <clears throat> oh. Is that better? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to do two, uh, make sure you can hear me and, uh, and see me at the same time here. Um, well, good morning. Um, I, I, uh, Chuck Regal, I'm uh, responsible for uh, Tomra's uh, public affairs uh, for the Americas um, and, and our deposit return compliance. Um, and uh, for, the, for the systems that, uh, from our perspective, but also for um, assisting our customers who are the beverage and retailer trades, as well as redemption centers, as you heard earlier. Um, I work in, uh, in the, predominantly in the US and Canada, uh, but our company works globally. And, and you heard a lot from my um, colleague, Mike Noel, uh, in, in the past. So, um, I'm joining at this point. I'm, I'm happy to be part of this conversation again uh, in Vermont. Um, but I, I wanted to, uh, so I won't belabor with any real presentation, but I want to uh, be available for some of the questions that uh, I know this committee has been asking um, uh, various people around service and um, technology and even those good five and maybe expanding points uh, that were raised earlier, that these are all very answerable um, questions. Um, and it's, in, in a lot of ways, we're addressing them today and don't want to give some sense that uh, with modernizing Vermont's uh, law, as is also being considered in New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, that these are um, the structure today in the law is capable of uh, for the system to uh, update. Um, we just need to be thoughtful about it. I like the idea of you know a concerted timeline. Um, there are definitely some tweaks uh, to the rules that could uh, make it more uh, effective and efficient. Um, I think where we're going to probably have uh, more discussion, and this is why I'm joining the, the working group now. Um, is around responsibilities and sort of what's cleared at what's set clearly in statute, um, and then how might a um, the um, the producers uh, organize um, some certain um, aspects or functions in the system? Uh, wanted you know we talk about sort of looking in the past, looking in the future. Today's program didn't envision. Uh, you know, commingling agreements at one point. It didn't envision third-party pickup service at one point. It sets the the law sets the sets the responsibilities in place, but those were innovations that came around. Even RVMs um, and that technology to be able to provide commingling, um, but also the data, the convenience for the retailers to have a uh, you know sort of a self-serve process. You know, those came about because the structure of the law was was clear and, and as far as who's responsible what they're responsible for, and then allow the industry to sort of figure out the best ways to um, go forward. As we discuss anything around a, a PRO, we want to make sure that what we're doing is not weakening the current law. We're, we're looking at the systems that we have in place and maybe bringing some strengths in, um, but we certainly don't want to give uh, we want to make sure that the, the expectations around targets and, and the deposit levels and what's in, in incorporated in the program, um, that those are clearly um, defined in statute because that helps operators like us know what, what to prepare for and how to then, um, like you said, make those changes. I don't believe this is gonna be one of those um, ac uh, events where things are left to chance. 
There are over 60 deposit markets in the world. My company works in almost all of them. We're, we're modernizing Quebec's law as we speak for full expansion, raising the deposit, um, looking at the redemption infrastructure. That'll be launched next year. Um, all these organizational plans are ongoing. Uh, Connecticut is also already underway for the same types of, of changes um, as our whole uh, markets in Europe are being launched from scratch. So when we talk about roll up times, this is very, this is uh, for operators like us in the system, we know how these, um, what can work. And we're going to try to bring that um, experience to Vermont. Um, so, uh, you know, when I, when we try to provide answers to questions, it's, it's with all that uh, working experience that we're that Tamra is going to uh, try to contribute, um, and I just want to uh, thank you for uh, letting me participate. Um, so thanks for joining us, and it's great you have experience in so many other places that are handling the same challenge. So based on your experience, I mean, so Vermont has a system now, and we're talking about trying to do better and expand what we handle. Uh, so we're not starting from scratch, but if you were, based on what you've seen happen elsewhere for a well-designed, well-implemented and well-rolled out program, what's the sort of timeline for such a transition in your experience, sort of short to long? And I think, you know, the emphasis from our point of view is to do it well, to do it, you know, sort of once and, and to really bring consumers along uh, as we do. Yeah, so that's a good question. So the, um, with, if, if, if we're starting from scratch, um, the standard uh, time frame could be around 18 months. Now that's, um, you know, 18 months as soon as the statute is clear and, and everyone knows that they, they have the responsibilities and, and can start organizing. Uh, we already have a program that's up and running. Uh, we have consumers who understand um, uh, where to return. They are already engaged by the value of the nickel. And if that were increased, um, they'd be further engaged. And, and possibly um, maybe those who, who haven't been would, would, would come back uh, to the program. Uh, Vermont already has, like almost every other uh, deposit program, uh, has the retailer mandate as its core. Um, it's important for that point because you have to, we have this obligation to return the money after, you know, after the deposit's been paid and the containers are returned, the deposit has to be returned too. So there's a fiscal re responsibility. Um, what Vermont has been able to do like some other states is also have enhancements. Uh, the redemption centers provide tremendous value in the state. They're, um, they connect with people. Um, and are also able to service better, probably the higher volume redeemers. Um, and uh, and that's, that's already key. Anything that's added on top of that, I think there are opportunities for enhancement. Um, uh, Bree had mentioned um, uh, a, a new concept. Um, that's important too, but we need to make sure that um, we don't uh, adjust the, the, the core backbone of the program. And that's making sure that every consumer who and consumers who can't necessarily wait two, three, four days for their money to be returned, that they can get that immediately. Um, so I'd say we're, um, you know, when we, when the program updated water bottles in New York state and Connecticut, it was done within a six month uh, period. Um, this is adding a new category, a category that was very clearly understood. We're getting into some complex categories, but they're not, it's not as if these, these companies haven't, um, aren't completely aware of how deposit works. Um, and, uh, and we do believe that there's some ways, things like product registration, which was talked about, that can be um, actually, uh, uh, some changes can be made in statute to en enable that to happen um, a, a, bit, uh, a bit easier. The um, raising the deposit will obviously bring in more volume and, um, and that's, uh, that's good for the, uh, pro, the health of the program. I think as it was mentioned earlier, is there some, you know, having more volume over fixed assets uh, can make uh, any investments more profitable. 
um, brings in more handling fees, but it does bring in some logistical challenges which have to be considered. Um, so what was the timing that was uh, spaced out in, in Connecticut, for example, where the, the debate's been recent about this, um, considered six months to a year uh, for, the, for the first adjustment. Actually in Connecticut, the original intent was to uh, raise the deposit on existing containers and then to expand the program to include more once, um, once consumers were engaged and uh, the infrastructure had a little bit of time to, to prepare for those additional containers. Um, and that, could, that can be done over uh, uh, in six months increments, it could be done over in, uh, in a year uh, plus time. But uh, we're not talking, like I said, we can start a program from scratch um, after the statute's been approved in, in 18 months. Uh, Senator Kenton, I apologize if you've already covered this, but one of the things that we've talked about, and please stop me, Mr. Chair, if, if it's been covered, is the pickup issues with with no, that was with, with Tamra. I mean, when we've been when I've been traveling around, the big issue is, hey, you know, we can do some of this stuff, and I, and I see you shaking your head. Probably heard this, but uh, Tom was coming to our place once every two weeks, once every three weeks. We're, you know, we, we walk, you know, our, our shops are packed. Uh, I suspect some of what you're dealing with is what we're all dealing with around uh, a labor shortage. But I'm wondering if you might just respond to that. And and as you, you know, for you as a company, what what are you all looking to as solutions? If this is something that you're seeing throughout your your region. Yep, and uh, it, I have been part of the, the conversations. This has come up um, over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, I myself, I, I uh, worked in municipal government when I started. So I had trucks on the road and, and understand that uh, the, the value of uh, um, service that uh, people you know, can rely on and, and communication. Um, I do know that when uh, I'm not going to say that any any recent complaints are are valid. Um, I, I you know they could be brought up any time to us and responsive, but that's uh, so. Let's I'll give that respect. I do know that when the um, the issues were brought up a couple of years ago, um, we we did have uh, the DEC had a, a series of meetings and we we the complaints really weren't there. Um, uh, the last year we didn't receive any formal complaints from DEC, um, but that doesn't mean that that there aren't mistakes made. And what I what I try to convey is that our, for a company our size that services um, the, the group that services Vermont is the group that services upstate New York. Um, the same management also uh, provides these services in Massachusetts and Connecticut and Maine. Is that we're very aware and and sensitive to the fact that. Um, uh, the, we want the volume in the system. That's actually how we get reimbursed uh, or, or paid. We work for the producers. This is we're carrying out their obligation. Uh, we have a retailer network that needs to be serviced. Now we've got redemption centers. Um, some are manual, some are, are technology customers. It's, uh, it's important to us to make sure that this is a, a high performing uh, program. Um, I do notice in Vermont, there are no, uh, I, I don't believe there's a frequency stipulated. Um, maybe in, in regulations there are, I just, I'm sorry, I'm not aware um, at this point, but in, in some markets, there are requirements that service be provided within every 10 days or 14 days, um, as well as sort of how reimbursements are made so that that frequency is, is met. Uh, you, you, hit, you picked up on, a, on an issue, labor, um, and, and COVID was, uh, was a challenge for us. Uh, but I mean, the, the, the labor issues were pre COVID, um, now not, not excuses, but we've had to sort of figure out how to try to balance, um, service, uh, with those, with those things. Uh, my understanding is that we are actually volume wise, you know, uh, below capacity so that we're, um, the, the Vermont operation definitely would be able to, uh, manage the increase in volume. Um, and with that just comes the, the need to be able to service more frequently. Um, and so th those, uh, we've had, like I said, we've had some markets where these, these issues have crept up and, uh, and we've put, a, put executive focus around it uh, to get them corrected. So um, I, that's the, that I, can, I can give you a commitment 
uh, that I feel very confident about, but I don't see this uh, a legacy of, um, you know, I, I hear complaints and I think that they should be addressed, but I don't see a systematic or systemic um, concern that we can't, uh, we can't address and, and definitely can address in preparation for, for an update if you, if you all choose to do so. Well, I think the Senator Camping uh, asked a question, and uh, although you may not be receiving formal complaints from DEC, I think literally all of us, you know, as citizen legislators, have gone out and talked to redemption centers individually as well as we have formal testimony. And I think it's about a 99% rate at which they say they have some difficulties in getting timely pickups from Tamra and they they end up overflowing their facility or um, so I, I'm not I'm not here to carp about hey, something. Yeah. I want you to be aware that the our experience from our retailers is that they're not satisfied with the current level of service. So it makes them very concerned about doubling or tripling the volume with, and saying, how would I possibly ever move all that material yep. if I'm already struggling with that? Yeah. Okay, and that's, um, that's, that's definitely hurt. I, I'd wanna throw a couple other ideas um, out there. Uh, you know, we, we, we dealt with this, uh, the increase when, uh, when water was added in, into, into New York and, and Connecticut, we know this is the biggest category. Uh, we had the same, you know, big influx of volume. Um, what we're, what, what's I guess an opportunity in Vermont, um, and Mr. Hayes sort of talked about it earlier today when he, when he talked about the, obviously how the technology helps benefit him, but it's this idea of compaction. Uh, Vermont actually has a, has a with, with redemption centers, um, uh, typically the containers are redeemed um, uh, manually and in whole bottle form. Uh, that's all fine. That's good customer service. Um, but in the RVM network, um, you know, the containers are compacted and that's, that's a space saver. Could we, um, you know, with, with what happened with COVID, we noticed is that as, as some of the retailers closed and some of the redemption centers stayed open, um, a lot of whole containers now entered the system. And that put more stress on the trucks and what they're able to actually carry capacity wise. Um, so we're, you know, I think with the um, advent of the, at least the new platform we have, maybe discussions with, um, with Bree and, and the members of the beverage trade, you know, if there are ways to uh, get technology um, into redemption centers where um, maybe it can help with the um, help with compaction or allow for compaction and cancellation of the containers once they've been redeemed, will be that actually will drive efficiencies on the logistics um, downstream. Yeah. Well, and I don't, I, I don't want to show thanks. We need to go out, yeah. but I don't want to try to problem solve it now, but just to make you. Uh, frankly aware of yeah. what we've been here. Thank you. Thank yes, you sir. That. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, I'd like to go to um, uh, Aaron Segrist. Ms. Segrist, good morning. I uh, wonder if you have any thoughts you'd like to share with the committee. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Um, for the record, uh, my name is Aaron Segrist. I'm president of the Vermont Retail and Grocers Association. I think this has been a great continuation of the discussion that we had with the work group uh, yesterday. Um, so just a couple of thoughts, I'll try to keep them brief. Um, I, I'll echo uh, Paul's comments that yes, we all did agree that there's need for dedicated oversight. Um, I don't, I'll apologize. I don't remember agreeing that we need two full-time employees, but we do agree that there's um, a need for dedicated oversight to address the issues. That being said, um, in, in hearing you list the five points uh, that the committee would like us to speak about, Senator Bray, um, I'm wondering now how we move forward because the bill as proposed, H-175, as well as the um, changes proposed you know, that were sent around by Matt yesterday, they don't get at the root of the problem. 
And in reviewing the five points on the board, um, those also don't necessarily get at the root of the problem as well. Um, just for a little back so history. Would, sorry, so just to make sure we're following, um, how would you describe the root of the problem? So I think it's, I think it's the first point. So it does get at one point, <laughs> I should say. We, we need more pickups. Um, you know, we, we need the, the third party processor to pick up more. And I think that, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a problem within the redemption centers, which completely makes sense, right? The redemption centers um, redeem significantly more containers. So of course, we're not going to see redemption centers lacking in pickups. It's the, the issue sits with the retailer. Um, you know, I, I appreciate Mr. Regal's comments, but putting technology in rep redemption centers isn't going to help the retailers and the retailers are the ones that need the pickup. That's, that's where we're all hearing the issue is. Um, H-175 is talking about expanding the scope of the bottle bill. So we're expanding the scope, but we're not getting at the root of the issue. We're not getting at, at the need for more pickups. We're not getting at the, the fixing the issues within the system. Um, you know, we've, we've been talking about this for years. We've had, it, we've had stakeholders meet, meetings for, for several years. I believe it was back in 2018, retailers and redemption centers. I believe every person, um, or every industry at, that is part of the bottle bill or the, the redemption system was sitting at that meeting where we all agreed that we need to fix the system before we can expand. And here we are, you know, four years later, the system is still broken. And I, I don't see how we can expand. We can't, we can't be talking about a rollout time, unfortunately. We can't be talking about addressing fraud within the system when we expand this, the scope of the bottle bill until we can actually provide the ability for retailers and redemption centers, large and small, with the support that they need in order to continue to redeem the containers that we that the committee would like to include into this bottle bill. So I think I, I think we have a long way to go. We we have a long way to go. I think that we can have a conversation about the creation of a PRO because again, we do need dedicated oversight. But we need the PRO, we needed, we need a dedicated person within DEC to understand what the issues are so that we can fix those issues. And then we can have a serious conversation, a thoughtful conversation about expansion. But without, without fixing the pickup issue, and it's not as simple as saying, you need to put into statute how many times they can pick up. It's not as simple as having them sign a contract and say, we will pick up because they have contracts and those contracts aren't being followed through with. So, I, I guess I'm stuck because I, I truly want to figure out how we can move forward and have a system that works to ensure that, that everyone is, um, everyone's interest is represented, but I, I'm stuck in, in seeing how we move forward without, we, without fixing the system. Well, um, thanks for being frank with us. You know, yes, apologies for being so frank. No, no, we, we are not interested in any in engaging wishful thinking anywhere around. So it's not helpful to any of us. Uh, Senator Campbell. So thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Ingress. So I just want to go back. So for you, in terms of fixing the system, just to clarify, it's really the pickup. That's what needs to be solved. Is that accurate? The pickup needs needs to be solved, yes. Um, so additionally, that, I, go ahead. No, go additionally, ahead. I think... I think that um, you know there we are leaving out um, a, a portion of the system from the conversation as well, and that's that's um, you know how the how the product is recycled. Um, we don't have any haulers as part of this conversation right now, and you know the haulers. So the haulers are, are okay. So you're not so you're not talking about now. You're not talking about town right? Tell us what you're talking about in terms of the haulers. The, so we've got um, any Vermont-based hauler that picks up recycling. Um, so we've got Casella, we've got, um, oh, I just yeah. 
lost the no, red hand I, family. I, I, yeah, <laughs> you know. that's helpful. I, I would just look right. The so they yeah. they bring recycling to the MRFs, and some of that recycling that we're talking about taking out of the blue bin it, and putting it into the bottle bill is taking away resources for them to help sustain the maintenance of the MRFs, to help sustain operation of the MRFs. How are we going to, how are we taking that money away from them to put it into a bottle bill? And then eventually we're going to see increased costs in recycling because we need to sustain the MRFs to recycle more. So I, I think it's, it's a larger conversation that we, we all have to agree that it's a larger conversation than, than three work group meetings in a week and a half. Well, we we are in not we're in an unenviable position at the moment. So <laughs> we all are understand. for sure. And and that's part of you know the when we started this morning's conversation, uh, I was asking Mr. Chapman, you know, like in the whole working group. I mean, uh, we need to have realistic expectations of what we can do in the final couple weeks of a session. Um, but the second thing is. Um, as sort of hot a fire as this bill is, we still need to sort of step away from it. And I think, in my opinion, to say, but to your point about looking at the other parts of the street, it is an entire, like an ecosystem of waste. I mean, whenever you affect one part of it, there's repercussions elsewhere. And we want to be, we're trying to be smart on uh, behalf of everyone and say, it's not just this bill, it's where do we want to be again in three, five, and 10 years? And our, what we do now ought to put us on the pathway to a better place three, five, and 10 years out, not be a detour. So we're cognizant of the challenge. And, and just to respond to that, I, I, I appreciate that last, that last bullet point. You know, where do we want to be in five years? And so I think, again, it, that's going to unfortunately take longer than, than a week, a year, a week and a half, right? So um, that's a conversation, you know, there have been conversations for several years about EPR systems now called PROs, um, but, you know, a limit moving product to a bottle bill when we don't know if that product should remain in the bottle bill when we have a PRO you know, those, those are conversations that we, we have to have. And unfortunately, I, I don't think a four person work group in the next week and a half can, can fix that system. Yeah. Well, we've picked an incredibly capable four person work group. That's, <laughs> well. uh, that's why. Um, all right. Um, well, so thank you very much for your testimony. Um, I, I have a, something to, for the whole group, and um, it's maybe a request to Mr. Chapman for, in terms of sharing information with your group, and maybe he already has, uh, but Senator McDonald prompted it, and it is that um, the nearest situation to what Vermont's contemplating in S-175 is what's happened in Maine already. And so Mr. Chapman spent some time doing an analysis of what's going on in Maine, and you know um, the questions that and looking at Maine as a model is, you know, what should we copy? What should we do differently? And what might we phase in? So I'll just leave those as questions for the, the group, but I'm, um, that was helpful. We heard that from a little bit of that from Mr. Chapman. And I think the group might also want to have the benefit of his research shared amongst yourselves. So thank you everyone for uh, rejoining and thanks for your continued work as part of the work group. And um, we're, we're all gonna see each other again soon, I know. Okay. Um, with that, we're gonna take a, a brief committee break, five minutes, and then we will be moving on to H446, an act relating to miscellaneous natural resources